we have some people joining. All right. Welcome. Welcome. We have, let's see, we have a lot of folks here today. And I can't see anybody's video because I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> so that was weird. I feel like I'm talking to the wall. Um, so we have today Bulgaria Tableau User Group. Welcome. Welcome, Bulgaria. And like I said, it's weird not seeing your faces here. And Stani is here to welcome us. And she and I were talking some Bulgaria trivia early on. So those of you who don't know anything about Bulgaria, I would go find out before you get to Kahoot. Hint, hint. And um, so does anyone know the capital of Bulgaria? This is a, a Georgia question, by the way, for those Atlanta people. I'm looking in the chat. I need to pull a chat. Come on, someone's got to know. Has anyone ever been? Oh, Rich got it right. Oh, oh I got, and Sophia got it right. Sophia knows it's Sophia. And a lot of folks knew it. Look at that. I, uh, I'm definitely throwing myself under the bus there because I had to Google it. So. I'm impressed. <laughs> so, so Sini, well, can you tell us maybe a little bit about the group? How long have you guys been in talk? Um, hi, Karen. Thank you for um, inviting us. It's really nice to be part of your group today. Um, I see that you have a lot of right answers, like the capital is Sofia. Um, Bulgaria is a really nice country, and we have a group which is a little bit smaller than yours, quite small. And uh, usually we have uh, around 10, 15 people uh, in the group. But it's um, like, it's nice to meet people when it was uh, like more, it was possible. We were uh, going together somewhere and uh, the communication, it was like uh, really face to face and we were able to collaborate between us. So uh, we started the group in 2016 and uh, have a few meetings during the year, like, quite less than you, but let's see. That's awesome. We're so glad you guys are with us. Welcome all of our Bulgaria friends. Glad that you guys are here. Everyone in Atlanta, I think it is, they are a few hours ahead of us. So it's the evening over there, it's eight o'clock um, in Bulgaria, but we're glad that you guys could be here. So welcome Stani and Bulgaria Tug. Stani, I'm curious, when was the last Thank time you. you guys met in person in your tug? Uh, we tried actually this summer, but it was a little bit uh, fail because not so many people came, actually only me and the presenter. So we continue with online meetings. <laughs> yeah, and it's a little bit hard, like, uh, at least for me, actually the organizers on the meeting, uh, we are three of us, like two guys are helping me. Uh, because now I live in Prague, so it's uh, really hard to be there sometimes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we don't have on-site meetings for now. Definitely and you understand guys? that. So we also have Aaron and Jim today, and, and we'll talk more to them a little bit later. So this is going to be an exciting tug today. Um, anyone have a quick Hello to, to share while we're getting prepared for the next, to get started here. Sure, we're happy to say hi. My name is Erin Waldron, um, and I'm just really excited to be joining the Atlanta Tug for the first time. Um, it's great to connect with you guys. Um, I'm in Kansas City, so we do a lot of Tug stuff here, but one of the fun parts right now of things, silver lining of virtual is that um, we can kind of have this mix mash of not just Kansas City joining um, Atlanta, but Atlanta joining Bulgaria, which is just so fun. So hello to everyone um, in all time zones. <laughs> And y'all, Aaron's design blows my mind. Okay. Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. Yeah, th this is Jim. I'm in Nashville, so uh, relatively close by compared to Bulgaria. And I'm really glad to be with you today. And we'll be talking later. Thank you guys so much for being here. We can't wait to hear from you guys. And now we discuss upcoming meetings. In this part of our user group, we find out what you would like to do in October. 
Yes. So what you guys are looking at is the Atlanta Tableau user group calendar. Um, if you haven't already checked this out, it's out on Tableau Public and the, what you see in yellow are our planned meetings for the remainder of the year. You can hover over previous meetings and get links to our YouTube videos um, and you can hover over um, upcoming meetings and get the invite um, and additional information. But we wanted to um, prompt everyone here to check out the poll. If you guys can pull up LinkedIn on your other screen or on your phone, there is a poll that should be relatively easy to um, take and it's out there on LinkedIn in the ATUG LinkedIn page. Um, we're, we just love to pose the question, if we were to plan an ATUG in-person gathering, just something for fun, a happy hour, um, a networking type of event, um, next month, would you be interested to attend? And I think you'll see there are three options out there on this poll. So you can select, you're not quite ready yet, which is fine. You can select, hey, I'd like to learn more, or you can select, I'm in, like, absolutely. So we'd love to get your, your thoughts and hear from you. Like, are you comfortable meeting in person? Is that something you'd be interested in? So if you guys can take that poll, that would be great. And um, let's see, you get, I see someone got an error on the page. There is a link in chat. I don't know if everybody's getting the okay. error. I think it's inside of the Atlanta Tableau user group. Oh, page. so you have to be a member. You probably need to be a member. Got it. Uh, kind of makes sense. But if you want to be a member, request yeah. to join and we'll accept you. Come yeah. on. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And if you're from Bulgaria, we're going to assume that you're probably not coming. <laughs> in person event in October. And Andy Wait, asked if day, day or evening time frame, and we've discussed both. So uh, like, think like an early afternoon. That's yeah. yeah, we, we landed on day. Yeah. We were thinking this would be more of a networking event, less of a like typical tug. Um, so instead of having like presentations and, and speakers and sessions, it would really be like a chance for us all to get together and be social and network um, since we haven't been able to do that face to face just yet. So so yeah. it is blowing my mind that we're in September of this year already. I don't know about you guys. Um, looking ahead also in November, and it's we don't obviously have this on here because it's not our meeting, but we have the Tableau conference. It's virtual and it's free. So if you haven't gone online to, to register, you could go ahead and do that now. Um, in the U.S., it starts on the 9th, so it's the 9th through 11th. In other countries, it's actually the 10th through 12th. So I just say it's the 9th through 12th because you can just, hey, join in another country's time zone and you can rewatch things. It's going to be awesome, but not as awesome as being at Devo Conference. <laughs> we can <laughs> That's pretend. True. We'll pretend. We're going to pretend. Oops, sorry. All right. So we have, um, we're ready to roll here on... Aaron's tips and tricks. And honestly, I'm, um, I'm writing some of these down. So Very you might good. want to do that too. I'm going to stop sharing. Sounds good. I'm going to steal the screen then. Oh, now I see y'all. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> We've been hiding the whole time and I'm going to always got all the extra time. zoom stuff. So I know y'all can't see, I'll say y'all cause I'm close enough. I'm in Kansas. Um, I can't see the Zoom stuff, but I will have to move a couple things around. So quick sanity check. Can you see a speed tipping slide? Yes. yes. Looking awesome. good. Okay. You're good to go. Well, with that, I'm not going to start the timer just yet. So give me just like two minutes to do a quick primer here. Um, like I said, I'm Erin. I am in Kansas City. Really excited to be able to join you guys today. I'm a fellow Tableau enthusiast. I'm a Tableau ambassador. I help run the user group here in Kansas City. And um, I'm fortunate enough to get to spend a lot of time with Tableau. I have my own analytics firm. I do a lot of Tableau training, Tableau consulting, get to spend a bunch of time in the tool, which is really fun. So today we're going to do speed tipping to give you a quick uh, sort of 
outline a little bit of where we're going because we're going to move really fast so just to make a promise that there is some method to the madness we've got our 60 tips hopefully delivered in 30 minutes um, and we're kind of splitting these up into uh, four different categories so we've got organized data tidy workbooks beautiful visualizations and flexible dashboards and what you'll see is each of these four categories has 15 tips and they'll kind of cluster around a couple of different themes so organized data we'll talk about the data source pane the data pane itself calculated field We've got some tips for the menu bar workspace and exporting, some building shortcuts. We'll talk a little bit about labels and tooltips, and then we'll also kind of finish out with dashboard size, containers, and the layout tab. Quick preface, since you will see this data shortly, we are looking at a data set that has GDP by country. So we're looking at 217 countries, 1970 to 2018. So we've got 49 years in there. This is coming from the World Bank and inspired by a makeover Monday from last year, I believe. We've got life satisfaction scaffold onto that. So we have some countries. We've got 2005 to 2018, so less, uh, less years there. And this is coming from the Global Happiness Center. So the data kind of looks like this could be the United States, could be Bulgaria, um, but we'll have the GDP for all of our different years. And then you'll see this life satisfaction data get introduced once we hit um, kind of the late middle to late 2000s. Um, one thing I always love about this little screenshot here is that when we do survey data and we ask, hey, tell us something one to 10, we often is, um, will ask people like, but you can't use seven because we all gravitate towards seven um, and we really kind of force people, all right, are you really eight through 10 or are you six or lower? And I love to see that as a nation with our life satisfaction here in the United States, apparently we're all going right to that seven. Um, so we will go really quickly. I will be, um, you know, brief for the both of us. I'll be going as fast as I can for 60 tips in 30 minutes, but you should sit back and relax. I had to make a cheat sheet for this in order to actually deliver it. So all of it is written down. You can find the pocket guide on my website as well as the Tableau workbook that uh, you'll see me kind of working in and we're recording this. So, you know, if I skip over something a little quickly and you wanna go back, that's one of the silver linings of getting to have this virtual and recorded. Um, so I'll just kind of show you. I can actually, um, I'll drop this in the chat real fast in case you wanna grab it. Where's the chat? Let's see. Here it is. So here's that website in case you want the uh, tips all written down. And with that, I'm gonna close this. We've got our workbook here. Quick sanity check. Can someone in Atlanta tell me that they are indeed seeing a tableau speed tipping? You're we see it. We see it. All right. Awesome. And then also a little honesty here, 30 minutes on the cell phone, 1212 if you're here, 812 if you're in Bulgaria or if you're in Atlanta, 112 in here in Kansas City. And are we ready, set? Okay, timer's going. So speed tipping, here we go. Let's start with data. So I'm gonna jump to the data source pane real fast and show you two things. A lot of these tips are gonna be coming from the place of the, they call it the sort of, uh, the, the burden of knowledge or sort of the difficulty of remembering what it was like to not know something beforehand. So a lot of these tips are gonna be aimed at folks who are brand new to Tableau or in their first year, still getting to know the tool, but we've got stuff I hope that will help folks who are further along as well. So here we are with the data. Let's talk about this connection real fast. Tableau is gonna default when you connect to a data source, to this live connection. And often that's what we want. We wanna pull that data in, have our dashboards update in real time. But sometimes having an extract can be a helpful thing for drafting. So if you are connecting to a big SQL database when you need a local copy that can speed up your drafting, so you're not getting a little wait time in between dragging each pill out if you're working with big data, that can be a helpful button to know about. The other one I'll show you is this filters button. We have data source filters. So if you're new to Tableau, one of the first things that we learn is how to bring fields into the filters card in the workspace. Sometimes if you find yourself doing that over and over and over again, you might actually want a data source filter where you can go ahead and filter the data before you even get to that workspace. So here, for example, if we wanted to just look at one region and have all of our future visualizations filter just to North America or just to Europe and Central Asia, we could do that here and kind of filter that data um, that executes higher in the query in Tableau, filter that data before we even get into our building space. Okay, new sheet. Let's hop into the building space. So we've got our data pane over here. This is where all of our beautiful columns and rows become pills we can actually work with. So a couple of things to point out. 
Tableau will make its best guess on the data type, but you can change this. So this can be really helpful, especially with geographic data. Sometimes Tableau makes its best guess, but it's mistaking something that's actually a zip code or something that's a county and not a state. You can always adjust those here. First tip that I always do when I get into a new data set in Tableau is bring out the count or the number of records, depending on which version you are in Tableau. Here, it's basically a count. So if you're new to Tableau, what is this? These are the number of records you've actually brought in to Tableau. You should always have a hypothesis in the back of your mind of how many records should you have. So here, I know I should have one record for 49 years for every country. So sometimes what I'll do is actually just build out with my count a little visualization as a sanity check that all of my data did indeed come through. So if I break this down by country, I'm going to see 49 records across. If I break this down by year, I should see one record per year per country. And it's just a quick check to make sure this happened across the board. We can go ahead and take this I'm going to pull this down here. We can take this and put it on color and show the entire view. It's going to get a little wacky here. Bonus tip, you can always just hide your headers here. But what can be really nice about this is this quick sanity check that you do indeed have one record per year per country. That's what's getting you. If you look down here, another tip, you are 10,633 marks, one mark per record. So I'm a big proponent of make your hypothesis. How much data should you have and why? And then build a little visualization when you first get in to check the number of records. Coming back over to our data pane, I'm a big fan of folders. So being the little bit of an organization freak that I am, I think it's really helpful to go ahead and come here and toggle from this data source table um, to, which is the default, to grouping by folders. And then you can grab whatever you'd like, right click, and you can group by the folders. You can then take these different variables into either existing folders you've made or make new folders. I like to put most things in a folder and then leave a couple items that are kind of the workhorse variables, the ones I'm going to be pulling out all the time over here. Don't forget about your search bar. GDP, for example, with this data set, we've got lots of versions of it, but sometimes when you are connecting to a database and you've got hundreds maybe of, of variables coming in, it can be really helpful to remember that that search bar is there. Another thing is these default properties you can set per individual data pill. So if you know you're going to be pulling out, for example, the current or the constant GDP, and you want it to always be dollar signs, or you want that growth to always be a percentage, go ahead and set those here, your format or your aggregation for the variable itself. And then every time you pull it out, you'll be set. Uh, I think this is actually a bonus tip, but you can always uh, add a comment. Uh, let's see, hello world which is fitting because we actually have people all over the world. And then when you hover over that variable, you get that little bit of metadata. This can be a helpful way to either communicate with colleagues or clients about, hey, here's what this variable actually means. A couple more things. You'll notice that I've got my little hierarchy set up here. This is a really wonderful thing that allows you to tell Tableau to establish a connection between the region and the short country name here. These are always nested. It goes from region to country. So if you have inherent established uh, relationships, some sort of hierarchical relationship in the data, you can always create that, establish that relationship in the data pane. And if you ever swap out your data set and now need to reconnect certain variables that have slightly different names, let's say in the new spreadsheet, someone just sent you region has now become regions, plural, you can go to click the drop down menu and replace the references and say, hey, Tableau, now region is actually regions. When you click on replace references, you'll see all your variables right here and you can clean it up. When you lose that relationship, everything turns red and there's exclamation points. It looks really scary sometimes when you swap out the data set behind it, but usually it's pretty easy to get things back in line. Last thing with the data pane, if it ever disappears like that, which can be really um, terrifying the first time it happens, just note that it's hiding down here. So you'll see this little toggle that gives you more space to work and it toggles back up. I remember the first time that I actually lost my data entirely, I was terrified. Quick calculations. I love to use a prefix when I name my calculations. I always start with C-A-L-C so that A, they cluster together and B, um, they are easy to remember that I made them. Usually if there's a problem, I introduced it into the logic and it's helpful to have a little reminder to say, hey, Erin, you produced this. It might be something that you need to fix. <laughs> um, your syntax or your functions for Tableau, if you're new, 
all of those functions are hiding behind this tiny little arrow that probably should be bigger. Shout out to Tableau. Um, but all of these functions are here and a lot of these will look very similar if you're used to working in R or Python or Excel, you'll see a lot of overlap here. This apply button, I always love to point it out to people who might be new because you can go in, work on your, <laughs> your logic here, and then go ahead and apply it to the visualization behind. And when you're really up against a wall trying to get something to work that just won't go, um, having that apply button is really nice because you don't have to keep opening and closing the work box here. Last thing in the organized data section, tip 15, the calculation is valid does not mean the calculation is accurate. Those are two very different things. The calculation is valid means, hey, Tableau can execute the syntax you wrote. You've remembered to put all your closed parens where they need to be, all of your commas where your quotes are in the right place. But it doesn't mean that it actually produced the thing that you meant to. Tableau is very literal because it is a computer. So my number one recommendation with calculations is as soon as you see that, yes, the calculation is valid, go build a calculation or a visualization that tests that indeed you have built the calculation you intended. Otherwise, I promise it will be your boss or your advisor or someone else, a client, they will be the ones to figure it out. Okay, that's organized data. We're moving right along to tidy workbooks. So I'm a big fan again of keeping the workbook pretty tidy. We talked about some tips for keeping the data pane tidy. Let's talk about the workbook itself. We can show how we want to see all of our visualizations. So if you want to look at all of your worksheets at once, you can come down to the bottom right hand corner here and see all of them. This can be really helpful if you've got a dense workbook with lots of different sheets. You can also make it kind of a film strip so you get this little preview of what it is and then you can put it with tabs and remember you can always change the color of any of these tabs sometimes i will turn something red if i know that i need to go back and fix some logic or something's broken um, to remind myself of where i'm at also you can hide the sheets right so if we go to a dashboard like this that's further along there is a lot hiding behind the scenes in this dashboard there's a lot of different worksheets. These are all hidden behind here. So if you're unpacking something that you've downloaded from Tableau Public or opened from a colleague, and you're thinking, gosh, this map has to live somewhere, where is it? You can unhide all of the sheets here. You'll see them proliferate out, and then you can rehide them when you're done. Another note you'll see here is I'm a big fan of sort of some sort of naming convention that is helpful when you're working with lots of sheets, especially if you're going to be handing that off to a client or a colleague who has to decode what you have actually built in your workbook. So sometimes I'll do, hey, if this is all going into dashboard one, let's give this a little prefix of one point something. Another thing I'll do is put what kind of chart type it is. So life satisfaction here exists both as a text and as this little spark line. So if I've got multiple versions of something that is would be named similar, going ahead and putting the, um, the chart type can be a helpful thing as well. Very important. I'm going to hide all of these sheets again, sort of collapse it up. When we see this difference between duplicate and copy, so we have two different options here. If you duplicate the dashboard, it will make a new dashboard, but it will point to the same underlying sheets. Whereas if you copy and then paste a dashboard, it will actually replicate all of the individual sheets underneath here. So in something like this that may have 10 or some so sheets underneath, duplicating it just makes a new dashboard, same underlying sheets, the perfect thing to do if you're just tweaking the layout of your dashboard. But if you're looking to actually start messing with those underlying visualizations, that can be a really helpful thing to just copy and paste the entire thing. The other thing that I will go ahead and save, say here is let's jump over to um, the work space itself. So if you're actually working on creating a new sheet, which is often what we need to do when we get frustrated and the equivalent of the analog, crumple up the paper, throw it towards the wastebasket. I'm always a fan, just make a new sheet. Don't delete anything that you've built. But this is a pretty flexible environment. Um, all of these cards can move around. You can hide the cards if you don't need them. Of course, if you decide you want to reset how Tableau initially had it, that is here. You can also introduce cards that aren't usually showing. So one of the ones that I think is most underutilized is caption. Let's hop over here where we've actually built something and show the caption. This will do its best to give us a little summary verbally right now of what's happening in this sheet. Sometimes that's helpful, but this is also a fantastic way just to have a text box 
on the actual worksheet itself, this can be a great place to leave notes for yourself, notes for a colleague, links to inspiration, whatever it might be. So that caption, I think, is one of the most underutilized things. Here's a quick tip. If you, we are all used to using the filters card here. Usually we take a pill to filters and then we show the filter, but you can also cheat. You can go right to region, for example, and just use this show filter button here. It'll add it to filters, add it to region. That'll speed you up. And like we talked about before, the summary stats down here can be really helpful as a sanity check when you know, hey, how many records should I have? How much data should be sitting there? That can be really important too. When it comes to exporting the data, here's like, or images actually, here's a couple tips for that. So I would say that Tableau's, as someone who has a photography background, the initial exporting um, function of Tableau was a little rocky. The images were pretty grainy. They have gotten so much better. So if you haven't used this in a while, come back and try it. You can go to the dashboard and export the image. I think this is a fantastic way to give colleagues, clients, a little sneak preview, something to drop in Slack or drop in an email attachment to give a little sneak preview of what you've built and try to entice people to log into Tableau server, or actually open the workbook to hear emailing them. Um, but people don't always have Tableau right there with them. They're not always moving slow enough to have that time. So exporting an image can be a great thing. Also remember, you can always click on any individual mark and say view data and say show full data. And you can see the individual records that are creating that mark, which can be a very helpful tip while you're decoding things. And if you actually need to save your workbook, which we've all hopefully done before, a quick note for those who may be new, the difference between a packaged workbook and a Tableau workbook, a packaged workbook is going to take that underlying data, scoop it all up and include it when you send that attachment or when you save that workbook. A Tableau workbook, TWB, no X, is going to be the Tableau infrastructure, the pipes, but nothing going through it. So if you are waiting for someone, for example, to connect um, to a database and then authenticate themselves, TWB might be fine. If you're packaging up an Excel worksheet and you don't, you know that the audience doesn't have that data with them, you'll want to use that TWBX. But you want to be careful about where you send it because that data is all included. And then something I learned about I gosh, in the last year was this export as version button, which was really neat. Um, this is if you're working with clients or colleagues that might be on an older version here, I'm working actually in an older version because of what a client's on, but you can go ahead and say, hey, if you're working with someone that's on 2019.2 and you happen to build what you built in a different version, you can export the version to match what those colleagues are actually on. All right, I'm checking my timer. We are right at 1530, so we're doing great. We're halfway through. Let's make a visualization. I'm gonna make a new sheet and I'm gonna build a bump chart because the bump chart has just always had a special place in my heart. So visualization tips. We all start with this show me panel. I'm a big fan of hiding it and learning how to build each of the chart types by yourself. What goes on rows, what goes on columns, what goes on the marks card and why. It's slow initially, it's fast in the long run. It'll speed you up. So if you can do it, hide that show me button. Here's another tip. Let's say you've got a variable that has got a lot of different ways that it can be aggregated. Time is a very common version. We've got year here. Maybe I want a continuous year. Maybe I want a discrete year, but if I pull it out, I'm gonna have to go ahead and change it. If you hold down option on a Mac or alt on a PC and pull it out. So I'm holding right now option on my keyboard and dropping year. It will go ahead and ask me, how do you want this aggregated? That can be really helpful too if you're trying to do account distinct on a variable that has a ton of underlying uh, items. So here I'm gonna go ahead and choose that continuous year. Get my little timeline here. Let's go ahead and grab GDP. I'm gonna take the constant 2010 so that I'm adjusting for inflation. There's the financial crisis. I'm gonna go ahead and break that out by country name. Bonus tip, I don't think I have this written down, but if you get this warning about how many items, are you sure you wanna add them all? And you're connected to a local extract that you know the amount of the size and you're comfortable with it, great, click add all members. If you are connecting to a database that has an unknown, potentially really huge number of items, um, maybe don't add all members. Take this warning more seriously. I might get a call from IT that said, um, Aaron, you just took the server down. We want to make sure we're not those people um, in Tableau. We want IT and everyone to have a good relationship with Tableau. So we will add all members. 
we will get something that looks very helpful if you're only interested in the top countries here in GDP. Totally unhelpful if you're looking at the bottom here. This looks like pickup sticks. So what we want to do is create a visualization where we can easily see the top 20 countries and how that's changed over time. So I'm going to go ahead and build a bump chart for that. I'm going to change this to a rank. It's going to turn into spaghetti. Bear with me. We're going to change the compute using from table across to make one line per country. We see something interesting here. We see that we have a lot more data for countries than um, the later we get into the years than initially, which means we know why we have our null values here. If you don't know why you have your null values, go investigate first. If you know why you have your null values, you can right click and hide that indicator. So for our bump chart, let's go ahead and edit the axis. You can always reverse the axis, which can be a nice little tip. So now we're gonna put the you know one going down up top. And we're going to go ahead and show the filter. So kind of a derivative off that earlier tip, you can show a filter off cards, pills that are on cards in your visualization, which really speeds us up here because we've already done the rank and told it how to compute. So I can show the filter. Now, instead of getting the GDP filter, I get a rank filter and I can say, all right, just show me the top 20 countries. We can always change our color palette if you want here. So if we want to do something, um, I don't know, a little brighter, you can always, where is it? There's the hue cycle. This assign palette is really fun. Also, you can always just double click and get the hex code right here on the card. So if you are in the branding world or you're trying to make friends with people in public relations, um, asking for the hex codes from them is the fastest way to make friends with public affairs. Um, and you can grab the branding and get really specific right there. We can say, okay. And or if we want to undo, we can undo. And from here, I want to go ahead and add some labels. So similarly, um, with the option key, I can hold down the command key and I'm going to grab this constant GDP rank and put it on the label. Oh, not going to take it off. We're going to duplicate it. Got to hold down that command key. And we'll put it on label. We see the labels go a little wacky here. So remember, you can always go into label and use some of these pre existing, like most recent options here. These I think are really underutilized and really helpful. We can go ahead and add the short name to the label as well. And this gets a little messy. So remember, you can go into the label, click this little ellipses. I feel like it's pretty hidden. Not really sure why. But we can go country name, give us our rank. I'm going to make that bold so we have a nice solid line for the eye to follow. And then again, that apply button, I can go ahead and move this across, see, does it do what I want it to do? Yep, it's working. And then I'm gonna go ahead and change that alignment, get everything to the right and to the top, and that'll clean up my labels. Another thing I'm gonna do here, I've got this kind of hanging off the side. So I'm gonna adjust the axis. I'm gonna go ahead and fix this. So it's gonna start exactly when I know my data starts. So I'm gonna go 1970, oh, change it, one, one. 1970 and we'll go to 1 1 2018 that'll go ahead and tighten that up we can i don't think this is written down bonus tip you can always change the size of your marks even if there's nothing actually on the marks card so we can kind of slim that down if we want and then last thing here let's format it so we have our eye is following the lines but we have some grid lines behind the scenes that are kind of throwing us off so we can go ahead and format We'll get our formatting pane where our data pane used to be. You can always X out to get back to your data. But a quick note here about the difference between the borders in this little icon and the lines in this little icon. So the borders are gonna be the scaffolding that's around your visualization. The lines are gonna be the things that are actually inside where the marks are also existing. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these zero lines. I'm gonna go ahead and actually knock out these axis rulers, axis ticks. I can see I still have something happen in there go over to rows, I'm gonna kick out those grid lines and I'm just kind of cleaning this up. And the reason that we wanna do that usually, I like to think of an analog version. If you're in third grade and you're asked to draw a chart on some graph paper, you're gonna draw out your axes so that you can actually create an accurate visualization. And then when you're done, you might go ahead back with an eraser and erase the scaffolding that's no longer needed. When we switch from analog and go to a digital tool, Tableau is generating a lot of that scaffolding that we might not actually want. So make sure what you keep when it comes to formatting is actually intentional as opposed to something that just, oh, this was the default and there we go. So we've got our lines, we've fixed our axes, we're all set with our labels. Let's talk about our tool tips really quickly. 
The first tip that I'll have for the tool tips is show your work. So if we are using rank here, what is that rank based off? Well, it's off the constant GDP. So let's add that to the tool tip. This helps your audience build confidence that yes, indeed, they are understanding why things are ranked, why they are ordered the way they are. Second thing, we encourage people to click on our visualizations, but when they click on a tool tip, or on a mark and they get their tooltip, the default is actually to show all of these buttons, these command buttons. And as soon as someone accidentally clicks here, they've broken the entire visualization, they get very anxious, we're trying to set them up for a positive experience. So helpful guardrails, go back to your tooltips and uncheck that include command buttons so that when someone is exploring the way you're asking them to, when they click, they just see the things that they should see, only include those buttons if you actually need them. Last thing, Get your tooltips tidied up before you actually start duplicating your work if you're pretty happy with your work. So I'm a big fan of, hey, I drafted something and it's looking pretty good, but is there something else out there that might look better? I like to, at that point, go ahead and tidy up the tooltips so that when I right click and I duplicate the sheet and all my effort is duplicated here, that I still have my tooltips cleaned up in case maybe I wanna make this a slope chart, right? And just keep the first, and the last year, I love slope charts. It's like, what's the beginning and the end? There is a very definitive question answered, right? If you just wanna know the start and end over the last 50 years of GDP, you see China just rocket to the top. So this can be a really fascinating way to iterate, keep duplicating and see if there's more there. Have you really tapped that vein dry? But also make sure if you do your tool tips up front, then they keep being um, all tidy and you're not replicating more work for yourself. Okay. Let's see how we're going. We're into our last dashboard, seven minutes. We should be right on time. I'm gonna move this on over. Let's talk about dashboards. So if we look at a dashboard that has been built, um, we are often thinking about how to make this on our own computer, as opposed to where it's actually gonna live. Where will the audience interact with it? So tip number one here, always make sure you think about where is the final living space of the dashboard and test the size and the formatting of that dashboard before you do a ton of layout work make sure your size works well where it's living if it's going to tableau server it's going to have extra framing around it try it on a desktop try it on a laptop another really good hint that i like to use a lot is if you know that folks are going to be opening this dashboard they're going to be on a computer you're not worried about that but you're not sure whether they're going to be on their laptop at home or maybe a larger desktop at the office one of the things I love to do is just introduce a range, keep the ratios identical, but let that dashboard breathe and expand, contract as needed, depending on where it's being viewed. So if you take this dashboard onto a bigger screen, it will expand. And that makes the audience feel like, hey, they made it just for me. Nothing is sort of a bigger red flag that this visualization was made by someone else for their screen than seeing the dashboard look kind of um, misconstrued when it renders on their own computer. All right, let's talk about containers. They're so helpful and yet I would argue somewhat finicky. Um, so here's a new dashboard. We bring out a container. We have horizontal containers, things that will line up like this, vertical containers, things that will line up like this. So when we bring them out, they have a blue uh, sort of frame around them. And the first thing I always do when I bring out a container is add two blank objects. These give me the ability to go ahead and make it much easier to introduce something in between. Sometimes landing something in a container can be difficult, so it can be really helpful to go ahead and put your blanks here and then you can delete them as you'd like. Um, another thing that I learned it must, very recently actually was that you can double click on this little four pronged uh, arrow on a frame and it will take you one level up. So if you're like, where does this item live? Double click, you can see that it lives in this container. This little uh, filter that was brought in actually lives in its own container. So if I get rid of that, just gonna delete the container, that might be what I want. Another trick, I love to use this, dist distribute contents evenly. It's a great way to make flexible dashboards that really feel tailored and polished. When you do that, you'll see that these stay the same. This is different than actually fixing the width. So if I undo that and I say, hey, give this some breathing room, you'll notice now that this item, I can go ahead and fix that and say, this should always take up this amount of space. So kind of working together, do you want things to be distributed evenly or do you want them to be fixed to a specific, um, a specific area? 
One other really neat feature that was introduced, and I'm going to go ahead and pull in a floating. So this is the difference between floating and tiled. Tiled is living behind this in a very specific way. If I pull this this way, this container is getting bigger. It's affecting the larger container around. Floating objects are going to be wherever you actually place them. Less flexible, sometimes necessary. One neat thing that actually now you can do with tiled as well, but is this little drop down. This is the show hide button. And you can actually have a whole container that will hide up um, and contract and expand. This can be a great place if you've got a, a lot of filters or something that you, or instructions that you kind of want to have available for folks, but get it out of the way most of the time. That can be a really helpful thing. So when you look at how does that stuff actually work with the, you know, a dashboard that's pre-built, for example, click on an item, double click, you can see this is living in a horizontal container. Double click again, this is living in a vertical container, double click again, and you can see, all right, now we're back to horizontal container. It takes a little time to get the hang of it, but it makes dashboards that are very flexible and very polished in terms of design. So I'm a fan. Last thing, we've got our layout tab here. So when I look at this, this is where I actually can find my X, Y coordinates. For example, I'm seeing that here, this is the container for the entire dashboard. It's at zero, zero. And when I come into something that should be 16 pixels in, because I've added one more in a layer, I've added 16 pixels of outer padding, that is going to hit right at 16 X, Y in both directions. You can also see on the background here or on the layout tab where the background is. So how are we making this container a light gray? We've done it here. And our outer padding and inner padding. So inner padding is what's giving that breathing room between the text here and the outer container here, or the inner padding that's giving us that little bit of space around text. The outer padding, what you can see is, I don't have any outer padding around here. It's going right to the side. If I, for example, added 16 pixels, keep your eye right here between these two gray containers, you can see that outer padding is going to push everything right in. Inner padding, outer padding, let's see, background color. Last two tips. So your item hierarchy is down here. Always at the very end when you're wrapping up with your polished dashboard, take a look at what actually is sitting in here. You should be able to click through and this should all be logical about what is actually sitting here. Sometimes when you start building, Tableau will introduce a bunch of extra containers that are unnecessary and you can kick those out. The last tip here is I found out from a colleague just the other day that you can actually name these. So here we're looking at all of our instructions. You can right click and you could say this is instructions. So that might be helpful if you're collaborating with another individual, you've got your dashboard really set up, you're happy with it, but you want to make sure that they understand in that item hierarchy, again, the hierarchy of everything living on your dashboard, all of the objects that you may have introduced over here, how are they all living together? That is where um, you can find that. So with that, okay, 57, 56 uh, seconds left. So I think we are all set. I will turn off this timer and I will go ahead and, and stop there. Let's see, do we have any questions? That was incredible. <laughs> I mean, I was pointing out and on the side over here and you probably see it, but um, I was saying that usually when I see tips and tricks, it's a lot of functionality, which is useful, but you tied everything back to use case and like that. Thank and, you. Um, I'm blown away. <laughs> Excellent. Well, any questions that I can answer? It looks like we didn't have any questions, just a lot of Perfect. right now. I think people are speechless, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good thing you have that link so they can go back and yes. revisit. So let me pull that up in case, because this is, you know. Yeah, we did put that in um, into chat and I, I see Perfect. that you have the video, but you also have a little um, shortcut guide. Yep. So we've got the workbook, the video of a, a previous version when I did this in Kansas City for our group. And then there's this pocket guide here that I'll kind of zoom out so you can see it um, if it wants to load. <laughs> um, so this is all of the tips. So everything that we went through here, um, wow. and maybe I missed some. So if, you know, if you find one, you're like, wow, she didn't talk about that. Um, <laughs> you may get a bonus tip in there somewhere. Um, but these are all here just so that if anyone wants to go back and look, um, and again, that all is living on my website, datadozen.com slash tablet. I love this, Erin. Thank you. <laughs> that is so cool. I love that PDF at the end, like all of the tips together. I haven't seen anything like that. So that is so cool. 
Excellent. Well, I'm so glad, guys. Thank you so much for including me um, in the Atlanta and the Bulgaria tug. It's so fun to get to connect with other folks, especially during a time where, you know, we all miss each other. So um, we miss, you know, TC and all of that. So it's really fun to get to connect with um, another group. Yeah, this has been awesome. I love you. Again, you did such a great job of not just like, hey, click this, click this, but like tying it together and why you would do it and the use case and so forth. So been, okay. this has been awesome. Thank you so much. What a gift. Absolutely. Well, let me stop sharing. Um, We're so happy oh, to have you. You're all back. <laughs> Sounds good. And thank you um, so much for having me, guys. And I will go ahead and hand it back to you. Sweet. So I'm going to take the ball and announce uh in front of everybody that we we are in the presence of greatness as we always are uh, but big congratulations to both miss anna ford and karen henson for and aaron and aaron well yeah absolutely and so, jim and jim yeah oh, yes. yeah jim <laughs> uh, for all being named uh user group ambassadors in the tablet community so super awesome stuff uh we also have a handful of folks to uh that we want to call out that are in the Atlanta um, Tablet User Group. So we got uh, Anthony as well. Uh, so Anthony's been uh, in the Tableau Public Ambassador Group uh, in the past, but uh, was once again named that. And then we've also got to see which direction the forums are. Nope, we're going up. Um, and then for the forums, I think this is forums. Social, oh, here we go. Now we're there. Um, so we got James Emery. Uh, who is named a community forums ambassador. So James, congratulations to you. And then Paul uh, Watchler, who uh, is also an ATUG member. So Paul was once again named a forums ambassador. So y'all, we've got such an amazing crew uh, that you know, brings their very best. And so just a big opportunity to celebrate these good folks. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a lot. Also, are we going to claim Robert Crocker as well? Yeah, we, we can claim there's a there's a handful of folks that we can kind of like de facto claim as well. Um, yeah, Crocker would be in there for sure. I don't know if he's uh, he's listening, but Robert, we love you wherever you are. So, yes, by all means. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Nathan, and I'm you gonna got this? start sharing. We're gonna kahoot, and we have a gift card for mm. the Tableau store for the winner of Kahoot. All right. Here you we go. All right, so you wanna explain the rules? Yeah, everybody disappeared. Hold on, let me get you back. Yeah, so head on over on your mobile device to kahoot.it and type in this number right here, 541-9971. Pick a family friendly name or not, you know. <laughs> yeah, Anna's a little edgy, so I think she would allow it. Yeah, it's not it's not um, high school math anymore. So there were there were a lot of students I'd have to go, mm -mm, you're out and I'd kick them back out. Different name. I know what that means. But since there are dollars on the line, <laughs> um, you know, we do need to be able to identify you in some way shape or form but but yeah what is the gift card amount oh jenny see. told me 30 30 30 it is 30. I was yeah, so gonna three say winners it. top three winners get 30 bucks so i actually played uh in the denver tug and got i think 25 bucks and i was able to buy a um like a green hoodie that says data across the front kind of fun Oh, wow. I want to, can I play? I want to win. Oh, wait, I wrote the questions. I can't play. Yeah. Yeah, Nelson, you're not allowed to win. And so, and so you know, our theme, obviously, we always start with an Atlanta. We have some sort of Atlanta theme, but we are also, in, we've invited Bulgaria here. And also, this is Tableau. So you need, you may need to know a little Tableau to do this. Or you may have learned it on the tips and tricks already. Ah, there's the people. Yes. Oh, it's just us. All right. 
So we have 72 people on the call. I see 32 people participating. We're gonna do kind of a last call here. How's the volume on the music? Is it all right? Good. It, it's not distracting. It's calming. I think I chose the Halloween yeah, music. Yeah, <laughs> But this is, it's not as spooky as I expected. Not very spooky. I know it's only September, but I'm so ready for Halloween. Let's see what disco is. Oh. Oh, there we go. Here we go. You can turn it up a little if you want. That's funky. All right, waiting maybe another 30 seconds for anyone else, then we're gonna get in, get on it. I see you, Matt Bigger. I think we're ready to go. It doesn't, the right. hasn't changed. So. Let us. You can still jump in late if you want to, because it'll still let you jump in. So. All right, here we go. And we're losing people. Whoa, come back. Come back. All right, here we go. Welcome to the ATUG September 2021 trivia. All right, quiz. Tableau Conference 2021 will be held. Where is the question? Where? Yeah, Thanks, baby. I guess I forgot a preposition on the first one. All right. Nice. Y'all are paying attention. And the link to sign up, it was in the chat earlier. So make sure you do. Nice. Matt Biggers got the fastest fingers. <laughs> Madison, number two. Here we go. Next question is where? Will tap up. No, when? I mean, when? When? <laughs> when? Okay. Nice. Okay. November 9th through 12th. Again, it starts in the 9th in the Americas and then it starts in the 10th uh, elsewhere. All right. Number three. So the latest release of Tableau, what are some new features? It includes features notifications. notifications. Yeah. yeah. Notifications directly to your Rolodex. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> right into Teams. Because Salesforce owns Teams, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> there you go. Nice, you guys In got Slack. it. It's, it's a pretty cool feature. If you're already in Slack, might as well. Yeah. Have you used it in real life yet? Slack or Tableau? No, no, <laughs> Tableau, no. I, but I've seen the demo and I, I thought that was cool. helpful. I'm All right, true or false? All right, if you put a pill on rows or columns, can you put a green bill, bill to the left of a blue pill? Can you do it? Uh, so this is green pills can never sit to the left of blue pills. Blue pills. That is true. That's Anna, true. why can't you do that? That's because the green pill creates an axis and it's a continuous variable. I mean, usually a measure and we need the, in their measures are sliced by dimensions and dimensions have to be in front of. Is there a better dis expl explanation than that? No, you crushed that. Okay. Good job. Tableau tip oh, number sorry. 51. Loop, pulling in the lead. <laughs> I love this <laughs> This one. one's for Karen. <laughs> since since, since we're in Atlanta. Say, you're welcome. Since we're in Atlanta. I love to tell, you know, they do this out here in Colorado too. I hope they do it everywhere. They're very yeah. good at consistency. Yeah. <laughs> Karen, <laughs> knew she'd appreciate this one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Moo. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I try to see how many times I can get them to say my pleasure. Is that wrong? 
not wrong and you're not the only one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> True or false in Bulgaria, people nod to indicate no and shake their head side to side for yes. So they do the opposite. Is that true or is that false? Look how beautiful Bulgaria is. Isn't that an amazing picture? It wow. is. I took that with my Android. Wow, he almost split it there on that one. It is true and it, it blew my mind. I asked Donnie about it and I said, is this true? And she said, it, it, it's, it's you said, is this true? Yeah. And she said, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and I, I can't. Yeah. And someone else said it's 80% true. So um, it, I, I'm, I'm assuming once you have um, people like demographics from other com countries coming in and, and changing the culture a little, you probably see it here yeah. and there, not as much as anymore, but I, mm -hmm. I, I thought that was a fascinating. That is. So Stani told us, what year did Bulgaria Tug have their first meeting? It's one of these four years. Which one is it? She did tell us if you were she paying did. attention. If you were here for the first five minutes, you should have heard it. 2016. 2016. You know, that's a not a majority, but well, almost. Good job. So more people got the right. You're adding it up. You're like, oh, no, yeah, I was like, wait, I knew there were 30 when we started <laughs> and there's not, but they're okay. Yeah. My math Everyone is knows, Anna math is a math. former stats teacher. So well, in statistics, we use a calculator a lot. <laughs> yeah. You had a, a, a donut chart in your head right there. Didn't you? <laughs> For a two member pie chart, I'm, I'm a big fan of a donut. Oh, same. Since ancient times, Bulgaria produces 85% of the world's Chick-fil-A. Carrots? My mm -hmm. sensor. Truffle or rose oil? Hmm. See how fast you guys can Google. I thought this was also really interesting. So many good trivia there. Yeah, rose oil. In fact, um, you have a lot of there was an area that's known for the roses specific to Bulgaria. And hmm. she even told me the best time to pick the roses. Wait, where did I find this? The bet, the time you have to start rose picking is at 4 30 AM. Wow. To get the maximum. Yeah. I should yeah. start quite early. Yeah. It's some special, um, some special fact, like otherwise it's. All right. Who are our winners? Brie or Bri, depending on pronunciation matt d and the big winner numero uno loop. loop we need to find out your real true identity is and then we're it's for the top three correct for all three that's right yeah each so of you if you could message us your email address we can get you your swag that's correcto all right awesome next up we've got the fabulous Jim who has, um, well, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself because we've been talking you up this whole time. Fabulous is just uh, just a great start. No, actually, uh, th thank you very much. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I got a little introduction built into the uh, uh, into the presentation itself. Wonderful, live from Nashville. Live from Nashville, that's exactly right. Uh, wait a minute, I just tried to open my screen and it came up with a question. Who can share? Only host or panelist. It's asking uh, permission here. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, it's make... not allowing. Let's see if it'll. Hey, Jen, can you make Jim a panelist? He's a co host. He should be able to. But it. Uh, what, what I'm seeing here is advanced, advanced sharing options. Interesting. Maybe. Um, <laughs> minimize it and try it again. This is my. Uh, so my... you're clicking the little carrot, click the center of the icon. There okay. we go. There we go. Thank you very much, guys. Sorry about that name and train me uh, before we started here. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Looks awesome. Okay. Very good. 
Hey, uh, I'm really glad to be with you today. Uh, you guys are one of the one of the premier tugs, uh, at least in this country. And now that Bulgaria is added in, it's probably the entire world. Uh, I'm I'm really honored uh, to be speaking with you today. We're going to talk a little bit about data sets that have all the data that you need in the data set, but they're just not structured properly, or they're not structured the way that you can get your uh, get an answer. So we're going to take a look at some real world data sets. But first, just a little bit uh, about me. I do live in Nashville. I'm a uh, consultant. I still do some consulting. I'm also a grandfather and I, uh, I'm kind of semi-retired. I think it's important for you to know that I am not a data scientist and I am not an IT professional, as we just witnessed when I tried to share my screen. But uh, I have an engineering degree and I, uh, I uh, also have a degree in business. And I spent most of my life working as a product manager or a business unit manager for consumer product uh, companies. When I started using Tableau five years ago, I was an absolute zero. I didn't have a clue. And uh, now, uh, after five years, I have uh, uh, I was just named for the fifth time as a Tableau Forum Ambassador, and uh, I do happen to be a Zen Master also. Now, what I want to talk about today are real-world data sets. And the first time I did this presentation, I don't know if he's in the, in the room. Is, is Doc Elder in the room? If he is, just raise your hand and wave at everybody. Uh, I, I made this presentation for uh, his undergraduate class. And we were talking about his class and what, uh, what they were, the type of students they were. And we wanted to introduce them to some real world uh, cases that you run into. Now, when I learned Tableau or any other language, we always started with what I call a solid data set. You know, you can think of that Excel spreadsheet where every cell is full and the data is just absolutely solid, pretty easy to work with. But you know, in the real world, we have data sets that don't, don't quite look like that. The data sets uh, have gaps in them, they have voids in them, and sometimes they're just plain sparse. And that's not because the data is dirty or, or, the, or the data source is a bad data source. It's just the way the data is collected. Uh, ERP systems like Oracle and SAP only record data when a transaction takes place. So if you don't make a sale today, there's no record for today in the data set. And then you have some third party uh, software that collects data for a specific purpose, but that may not be adequate to meet your needs. Well, what we're gonna look at today are three real questions that came in to the, uh, to the forum. And these happen to be questions that, uh, that I happen to answer, but we're gonna look at three different types of questions. The first one is what's known as the two date problem. It's a classic, it's, uh, it's when you have a data set where each record has a start date and an end date, and you wanna look across the data set and understand what happened in between. The second is what happens when you have a data set that is very solid at higher levels of aggregation. At the top of that pyramid, the data set is very solid. But as you drill down into it, you hit voids and the data becomes sparse. And then the third, uh, the third example we're gonna talk about is maybe something you ran into uh, yourself is when you hit a void in the data set and all of a sudden the screen goes blank. Let's take a look at that first, uh, that first example. Uh, it's a two date problem. This is, this is classic. We see this maybe two or three times a week in one form or another. It's where each record has a start date and an end date or a way to, uh, a way to calculate the end date, but you wanna know what's happening across all the dates. And this is the type of thing that you might be a, a finance manager or a, a, a loan manager in a bank. And you're looking across a number of different loans that are outstanding. They all have different start dates. You know what the uh, monthly payment is and you're trying to, trying to determine your cash flow. Or you could be, like the HR manager who sent us this data set. And his question was, he says, look, I've got a number of job recs that were open throughout the year. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to see how many I filled each month and how many were still open. And he looked at it, I looked at his data set and he had a start date and he had an end date and then he had some other information. And I've cleaned this up a little bit. And what he was really saying is, I can't get these things to line up. I, you know, I've tried this, but it just doesn't line up and it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. What am I doing wrong? When we think about what he's, what he's dealing with, he's got two dates and they're totally independent dates. They don't really know each other. Uh, what he wanted and what he needed was a calendar and he didn't have a calendar. He wants to put, put his dates on a calendar and see what's happening across those months. Well, this is a fairly simple data set. 
so what I looked at was just going to Excel and I made a scaffold. And uh, just very simply, I put the first date of each month, January through December, and that date is, uh, that's going to form our calendar, if you will, when we join it to his other data set. Now, what we want to do is we want each record in this data set to join with every record in our scaffold. And to do that, we use what's known as, known as a Cartesian join. And it's very, very easy to do. We just bring the two data sets together and we can create a uh, relationship calculation, just one equals one. And that's all that's needed to create the scaffold. And now when we go back to our data and we bring the scaffold dates to columns and add as uh, open job recs, it's beginning to look like what we need. Now, his first question was, how many, how many jobs did I fill each month? So at this point, we just added a simple calculation. And I like to use LODs. I, you know, someone's probably sitting there saying, well, you really don't have to use an LOD for this. And you're right. In his real data, we did have to use an LOD, but uh, I just like to use LODs. And I, I used an LOD for this, and we'll see why later. OK. All we did here was take a look to see if the first date and date trunk is going to return the first date of the month. If, if we take a look at the first date of the month for when the job was filled, and if it's the same as the first date of the month for the date scaffold, I bring back the, uh, the uh, job ID, and then we just count those. And you can see when we do that, we can look across and we can see, well, yeah, this job is filled in October, so we've got a value of one out there. And all we're going to do at that point is we just add them together. Now, his second question was, well, how many jobs were still open? We're going to use the same approach. It's the same idea, idea again, except we have to check to see that the scaffold date was after the job was open, but before the job was closed. And when we do that and bring it to the, uh, bring it to the this, we can see here that, yeah, sure enough, this, uh, this date was, uh, it was open in September, was filled in October. This uh, uh, date was open in October, and it's never been filled. So we're, we're counting the jobs that were still open by a month, and we can total those. Well, once you've got that, now it's very easy to look at that in any different way. You can look at it as a text chart, or you can look at it as, a, uh, as any type of chart that you want. Well, we take a step back. His issue, what he was facing is he had a data set that he got from uh, you know, some third party uh, software that he was using and had all the information he needed, but it didn't have a calendar. So we had to sit back and say, well, how can we make a calendar? And we made a calendar by creating a scaffold in Excel and joining it together with a Cartesian join. And that's all there, that's all there was to it. And once we did that, the rest of the analysis was very simple to do. Now, our second example takes a look at what happens when you have a data set that's very dense at high levels of aggregation, and it falls apart and breaks down when you start drilling into the data. And for that, we're going to use an inventory model. And the uh, uh, member that wrote the question was a uh, inventory analyst, and he was having trouble calculating a metric that they use known as days on hand. And those of you who are familiar with inventory, I know what that is, and we'll get into it a, uh, a bit later here. But we're going to look at an inventory model. And I think I need to explain a little bit, a little bit about, uh, about where his data uh, came from and uh, why he was having problems. He was pulling data out of an ERP system. It was either Oracle or uh, SAP. And if you know anything about those systems, they, count, they create a record anytime a transaction takes place. And they create that record at the lowest level. And we're going to be taking a look at sales data. So this was coming off of a sales order. And then internally inside the ERP system, there's a hierarchy. And that hierarchy will total uh, from the line level up to the product sales, up to the product line sales in, in uh, total. And if we were to look at that, at the lowest level, the data coming off that sales invoice is precise. We know who bought the product, when they brought, bought it, what they bought. Think of it like line level data the quantity that they bought and the dollars that they bought, okay? And as that data gets aggregated, 
that data is still very accurate. I mean, all we're doing is adding numbers together. You know, and computers do a pretty good job of that. We're adding numbers together. So the data is still very, very accurate till we get to the top level where we have two numbers. We have the total quantity and we have the total dollars. It's accurate, but it's a whole lot less useful, okay? Now, the next step in his process is to take that same data and create a forecast. And sometimes it's called a demand forecast or a sales forecast, but that's the forecast that feeds his MRP system, determines his, um, they set the production schedule and production orders and you start buying materials. Now, that forecasting process starts at the top, taking what they know, this very accurate but not very useful total sales data and starts breaking it down by product, by SKU, and eventually by uh, some date that's in there. So we're starting with this most accurate number, which is you know, just a dollar value and a quantity value, and you disaggregate by product and by color and by SKU. And then we start looking at his data was actually wanted to get down to days, but Julia looked like days or weeks and you, you had a time element in here. And that's the forecast that's being passed on uh, to do the production, production planning. Now, everybody involved in this process, whether it's the inventory manager or the product manager or somebody in manufacturing, they understand that this, is, this disaggregation process adds a lot of, uh, a lot of question in uh, just how accurate the number is. There's a lot of assumptions being made along the way. So while this bottom line number is the number that's most useful, that's absolutely essential to do the production planning, it's also the least accurate number on the page. And for all those reasons, uh, inventory managers and product managers like to have a little barometer, a little very easy to calculate metric to tell them, well, are things on plan? Are they going off plan? Or is there something I need to look at? And that measure and that metric is usually referred to as days or days on hand or days inventory. A lot of different names, same calculation. All you do is you take the inventory level in units and divide it by the average daily sales. And you end up with days. Well, that's pretty easy to figure out. And our users send in data that look like this. And he said, I've got this data and it, it works. It, it, I, you know, I know it. It works real well, and he says, I'm, I'm calculating values here that are, are, are pretty good, but something's going wrong when I drill down into this data. It doesn't seem to be doing what I think it should be doing. And if, to look at the calculation, all he's doing is taking this number, his inventory number that comes out of his, uh, his ERP system, and he's dividing it by the average of the sales numbers that come out of his ERP system and to calculate the days on hand. So if we take a look at his actual calculations here, um, To look at his, his days on hand calculation, this column right over here is nothing more than the inventory divided by the seven days of sales. And if we take a look at his seven days of sales number, now when we look at this, for those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, table calculations, right away you're beginning to see, well, maybe this is where the problem is. He's using a function called window average, a table calculation to sum the last seven records that are recorded in the database. And at very high levels, very aggregated levels in his data, there's a sale made every day. But as you start disaggregating the sale, there aren't sales made every day. So I'm gonna open up the, he had a filter here because he only wanted to look at the last day. I'm gonna open this filter up and we're gonna take a look. And let's take a look at company B. And we can take a look at the last seven records here and they started on the 10th and ended on the 27th. Those were 17 days worth of sales. So while he thought he was calculating his days on hand accurately, he really wasn't calculating the days on hand accurately. And if we open this up, and I think I can open this up without too much trouble and just take a look at the missing data, you can see what the last seven days of sales actually look like. There was a lot of voids in the data set. And as a matter of fact, this is a sparse data set. There's more more missing data, at least for company B, than there's actual, actual data on hand. So now we're left with, how are we gonna correct this problem? We need to fill in a record for each one of these missing days for each one of these customers. And to do that, and this time we, I created the scaffold, it's getting a little bit too involved to do in Excel, although you could, 
uh, I went out and I used prep to create the scaffold and, and join the two data sets together. And we did nothing more here than take his individual dates and his customer names. And once again, used a Cartesian join one equals one to join these two data sets together and expand the data set. And then we came back and joined that to his inventory data. So now we filled out the data set. Now I want to get back to uh, where we were after the data was uh, after the data was uh, scaffold. I added a ZN function so that we had a, a zero for all the sales that were missing. And you can see now we've actually got seven days worth of sales that don't end on the 27th, but end on the 29th, which are actually the last date in his data set. And it covers this period of time. And I'm just going to take false off here so we can look at where he originally started. He wasn't looking at 11 days worth of sales. He was looking at 66 days worth of sales for his days on hand. So let's take a step back again. I mean, here's a, and this guy was a very good, uh, I'm gonna call him a subject matter expert or a SME. Uh, he was a very good inventory planner and very good inventory analyst. The issue that he had was his data was sparse. And he didn't, he didn't really understand how that data coming from his ERP system could be inaccurate. And, you know, it, it was something that just uh, didn't connect real well with him, but that's okay. That's not his responsibility to understand that. It's our responsibility as developers or designers or whatever term you use uh, as, a, uh, as an analyst to understand how the data structure can affect the overall, uh, the overall results that you get in the data set. And it's our responsibility to deal with it and make it right, uh, right for him. Now, I'm gonna go on to the last topic. And that's what happens when we have voids in the data. Okay. We just looked at an example where the data was sparse, where there's a lot of data missing. This is a little different situation. This is, this is a situation where you're filtering the data and all of a sudden the screen goes blank and you hit what I call a no record null. There's no record in the data set for the combination that you hit. Okay, And that's very different than a empty cell null where there is a record, but there's just no value in that record. And the easiest way to look at this or to visualize what's going on is with some um, superstore data. That's the same data set that you got when you got your, uh, your copy of Tableau. And as a matter of fact, the, the person that uh, wrote in the question was showed us the example in um, using the same data set, using uh, the superstore data set. And the situation arises when you have data and you filter down to the point there's no data available to plot. And all I've done here is I've taken a look at a couple of data, uh, a couple of subcategories, arts and uh, envelopes, and I looked at a couple of different uh, year months, uh, September and February, and we're just looking at you know the uh, the sales on a daily basis. And if I come in here and I take out uh, September. We still got data, something's still showing up, but if I take out art, all of a sudden my, my screen goes blank. And it goes blank because there's no data, there's no data associated with February 16th uh, for envelopes. There's nothing to bring back. Now you may have experienced this and you may say, oh, well, I'll just change my filter around or you may not really know what was, uh, was going on. Uh, but our user here, our user here used the same data set to illustrate her problem. Now, first of all, she's much more experienced in Tableau than I am. She's been using it a whole lot longer than I, than I've been using uh, Tableau. And on top of that, she's a very good analyst. And uh, she sent this problem in and she said, well, look, I've got, uh, I'm doing this analysis and the analysis she was doing is sort of an advanced analysis. She was uh, using small multiples to show what's happening across all the values in an entire dimension as you make changes to, uh, to filters or values that, uh, that will affect that data. And obviously superstore data is not her real data. If you haven't done this type of analysis, you ought to look into it. Uh, Kevin Flerlidge on his site has a great, uh, a great uh, plug and play model that you can use to, uh, to do uh, this type of analysis. But her question came to us, the same type of question. She said, look, I've got 17 subcategories, 
and that's how many are in the Superstore data set. And uh, I can see them all and everything's fine. But when I come back in and I filter out some data, all of a sudden, I've only got 13. And she said, well, you know, there, and first, she had two questions. The first question was, what happened? And then she said, I can't possibly explain this to my, uh, to my user. They just wouldn't understand what's going on. What happened and how do I deal with it? Well, what happened, and it, what, what happened, and as you know by now what happened, is she's hit a void in the, in the data set. And the solution again is to come back and use a scaffold to flush out that data set so that every record uh, exists in the data set and then, and then we'll be able to look at it and plot it out. Uh, same process again, I went out and used PrEP. Uh, PrEP's a good tool for this, it's a great tool for it. There are others that are available, but uh, PrEP's a great tool. And all I did was take a look at every date and every subcategory, join the two together, once again, using this one equals one Cartesian join criteria. And you can see down here how it just exploded the data set. There's now like 25,000 records in the data set. Then we came back in and joined back in her original data. And then we were able to look back at the data set, bring that back into Tableau. And now when we look at the data and I've added a ZN function to put a zero where there are no sales, where the, where the cell is null. We've got a cell now, a real cell, and we're gonna put a zero in it uh, instead of having an empty cell null. And now when we look at the data, there's 17 categories. And when we filter out September and we're left only with February, there's still 17 categories. Four of them, bookcases, envelopes, copiers, and machines don't have any don't have any sales. They're, they're no, uh, no values in the data set, but we didn't lose the data set and she, didn't, uh, she was still able to explain it to her users. If you take a look at the actual data that underlies this and you can look in here and you can see here where I put in the ZN, there are no sales, there are no values for sales and there are no values for profit. But by, by scaffolding the data, we were able to force a cell in each one of those, uh, uh, each one of those combinations filling the voids with the uh, ZN function. Okay, well, those are the three examples I wanted to share with you today. And there could be many more use case examples. These three examples, you happen to be able to work with, um, you happen to be able to correct the problem with the scaffold. Obviously that's why I chose them. There are other examples where you have to restructure data sets where you have to use a different technique to get the structure that you need to, uh, to, to meet your overall need and to get, to get an answer. A couple of important things to understand here is your end user is going to be a, he's going to be a great deal of help in the situation, but he's not going to understand the problem. Uh, you have to think through it in solve it form. I do have time for questions. If there are any questions, uh, gladly take them now. I am looking Apparently. for the, the questions here. Um, there were some other questions just on tips, and I was looking to see, does anyone have questions for Jim? Jim, that was amazing. Um, one thing I found with working with data and really getting into real world data, as soon as you feel confident, you're like, I got this. I did this awesome thing over here. And then you're like, okay, here's your next data set. And you can just, the structure, It. what do I do with this? And knowing that there are these workarounds, especially, um, and, and I've, I've used one similar with the relationships after relationships um, were introduced and then have it getting to, I think it was like 2020.3 where you were allowed to put in the calculation in the relationship and to get that one-to-one, -one, cause I, th I think they added that after. And then, you know, getting that, that um, being able to work with the data in a different way was helpful. But yeah, I get that hot under the collar feeling every time I see a data structured somewhere different, I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, two points there. Uh, first of all, it grips you wholeheartedly. Whenever you get a new data set, first of all, go out, open up, open up the data source page and take a look at it and make sure it's what you thought it was. But if you find yourself sitting there and you're, you're trying to make things match, like our HR manager was trying to make things match and it just doesn't work, it's a pretty good indication the data structure is not good. And then you have to go back and you have to come up with a strategy about how to, how to make it right. What's missing and how do you get that missing piece like his calendar, how do you get that into the data? 
uh, our second and third example is there were just voids in the data set that had, that had to be filled. You're also right, when they first introduced relationships, you weren't able to write a calculation to join the, to join files together. And um, it, it made it tough. I found myself going back out of the virtual layer and into the physical layer just all the time and, and doing it that way. Wow. Well, this is why uh, Jim is a Zen master, by the way, because he he can Zen the data and, and make it work. Um, uh, there is a, a question that says, is the workbook available? Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you what, I am going to put those. I would agree. Workbooks like are available. I'm, uh, I'm just going to put this out there right now to uh, everyone. Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Not only is the workbook uh, available, but uh, also on my blog, I have put the words behind the, uh, uh, you know, behind the workbook itself. So the workbook is available on my uh, Tableau public site and the write-up is available on, uh, on the blog. All right. And that's just been sent out in chat. And I'll also include that in our follow-up email for everyone who joined us. They'll get these links along with everything else we shared today. Okay. I want to thank you guys for, uh, for inviting me here. I, uh, the Atlanta tug, uh, I go back to the days of Andy Piper and Andy, I know you're out there someplace. I, uh, I met Andy. I don't know. It's maybe my first, my first, uh, uh, TC, live TC, you know, that, that, that shows you how long, uh, how long ago it was, but, uh, you guys have been great. Uh, you're a great model for other tugs to follow. Thank you. That, that is really, really kind. I, um, honestly, I've, I've only been, I think it's maybe it's been a year that I've joined them. I got lucky. They were like, would you join us? And I honestly always wanted to be, um, to do the, the weekend news on Saturday night live. Um, but that they were not hiring. So, um, a tug sounded like a really good idea. So. That could be a new segment though. I mean, <laughs> we can update a tug style. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe you've uncovered something significant here for Anna's career. <laughs> Always wanted to be on Saturday night live. I'm on, probably a little too goofy, but we'll, we'll, I'm working on it. So, um, you guys can message us, email us. Uh, there's some links, like I said, I'm going to, we're going to send out an email, with all of these links and ways that you can get in touch with us along the way. And if you have any um, suggestions for your future topics, anything you want to see, if you want to present any interest in any kind of networking events, just get send that stuff our way. Absolutely. Nelson and Karen? No, we're excited, uh, especially the idea of uh, getting back together potentially in October. So we'd love to see that happen. We've got. Uh, some cool things that could could definitely come to life. So pumped for that. Karen? Just want to say um, thanks to Stanny and Bulgaria Tug for joining us today. And um, it was nice meeting you guys, even if it was virtual. Yes, it was thanks nice to Thanks for being a part you. of our Tug today. I can't <laughs> say you yes to you guys. <laughs> and of course, Aaron and Jim, excellent job. We really appreciate oh, you guys. Oh, fantastic. Excellent Thank you for being friends of ATUG. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon and great weekend. And thank you to everyone behind the scenes as well. We've got folks that put these on YouTube so later you can see the recording. And we've got, of course, Nathan, our Kahoot Sorcerer. And doing all the things to make this happen is Jen Lisberg. We've got the people from Tableau who also make it happen. So thank you guys. We appreciate it and um, have a great, what is this Thursday? It feels like Friday. Ben. Bye y'all. Bye everyone. Bye.